Good evening and welcome. Um, I am Annabeth Soren and I direct the Honors Independent Research Study here at St. Mary's. And it has been my privilege to work with 14 of our seniors this past summer and for the semester while they conducted research with faculty, with, excuse me, with community mentors. Um, and what I really want to stress is that none of this would be possible without mentors in the community offering their time and their oversight into the project that these students do. And so they really deserve um, our utmost thanks. We have, as I said, 14 presentations to get through. So we're going to do this um, hopefully in a streamlined manner. So we are going to have seven presentations, as you see on the front page of the program. We will then have those seven stand up, and if there are any questions for them, we'll have about a five-minute question period, and then we'll take about a 15-minute break, go out, enjoy some of the beautiful um, charcuterie boards that are out there, go to the bathroom as needed, have some water, and in about 15 minutes, we'll come back in. We'll have the second group of seven students prevent, present their research. Again, they will stand up, have about five minutes of questions if anyone um, has something they want to get a little bit of clarification on. And then we'll commence the program, and uh, sorry, end the program, and then go out and finish up chatting with each other, hopefully, and congratulating them on what I'm sure will be jobs well done. And so we will begin. Hi, my name is Josie Block, and this summer I had the opportunity to work at the University of Memphis with Dr. Powell in the health science department working on inertial measurement unit or IMU event detection. So running is an activity that can be done recreationally or professionally or just to get from one place to another. And running has been researched um, in the past years to enable um, products to be developed such as shoes, um, so that it benefits runners and also running form has been looked at to prevent injury and to make sure that runners are um, getting um, like the best running. But <laughs> so basically um, running starts with initial contact or heel contact with the ground. And then as the body starts to lean forward more, weight is fully shifted onto the foot and then Finally, the toe comes off the ground, resulting in toe off. And then for a little bit of time, there are no feet on the ground and the other leg swings forward and it has initial contact with the ground. And then that is the pattern of running and it keeps continuing on and on. So in the past, um, this has been the system that has been used. It's called the camera-based motion capture system to um, look at running form. And it's highly reliable. Um, it, how it works is there's a bunch of cameras that are installed into a lab and they shoot out an infrared light that reflects off of the sensors that are usually placed on the joints of the participant's body. And then the sensors reflect the light back to the cameras and it's picked up on the cameras and then it can be evaluated on a computer later on. But the only thing with the system is that it can only be done in a lab because it has to be installed. And running in the real world does not take place in a lab usually. So there's usually hills and uneven ground and stuff like that when you're running. So that's why these IMU sensors have been developed so that running can be tracked in the real world because they're more accessible and they're a lot smaller and they can just be clipped onto a shoe or even put into watches. So this is the sensor that we use. It's called the Delsus Avanti Trigno sensor and it measures triaxial accelerations and velocities which means that it measures the X, the Y, and the Z components. And it also picks up the duration of the movement and the intensity and the frequencies. Um, so the goal was to identify IMU-based signal characteristics indicative of initial contact and toe off during a treadmill running task. So even though this experiment was still being done in a lab, um, the goal for it in the future is for this sensor to be um, tested more in other terrain as well. So the runners um, were running on an instrumented treadmill, which took ground reaction forces. And these ground reaction forces were the criterion method because 
you can either be on the ground or off the ground. And while they were running, the sensor was also attached to them, picking up the same events as the treadmill was picking up. So how this was done is we had 15 recreational um, healthy runners and they came into the lab and three sensors in total were placed on them. So there were two sensors, um, one on each foot and then one on the back of the waist. So the ones on the feet were placed on the lateral calcaneus below the lateral malleolus or on the outside of the foot right below the bone. And then the third one was on the back of the waist to act as sort of a center of gravity point. And so then the runners completed a five minute treadmill running task at their preferred pace. And 30 seconds of data was taken from the second minute, the third minute, the fourth minute, and the fifth minute. And the goal for this was for the ground reaction force data and the IMU data to be up at the same timestamps for the events. And so then when we got all the data, we did, we subtracted the IMU data or we did the IMU data minus the ground reaction force and we got the difference in time. So the goal was it for it to be zero or have no difference at all. So we picked up um, 921 initial contact events. And so for the sensor to be considered um, working well enough to be tested outside of the lab, we wanted 95% of our data to be within the first two frames of error. So from zero milliseconds off to 10 milliseconds off was considered no error at all. And then from 10 milliseconds to 20 milliseconds was considered one frame of error. And then from 20 milliseconds to 30 milliseconds was considered two frames of error and so on. So as you can see here, 59% of our data was within no error. And then 97% of our data was within the first two frames of error. And then if you look over here, this graph is called a residual graph. And the dots along the zero are the dots that had no difference at all when the it was IMU minus the ground reaction force times. And then the further it gets away from the zero line is um, the further the timing was off. And also a PRP value is very small, showing that there's no significant difference between the two um, ways of tracking. Also for our toe off events, we identified 843 toe off events. And again, 59% of our data had no error. And then 98% of our data um, was within the first two frames. And then this is the residual graph for that one. Again, just showing um, the how far from zero the difference was. So in conclusion, since 95% of our data was within two or fewer frames of error, it confirms our success at picking up the heel strike and toe off events. And so this means that in the future, the sensor will continue to be tested outside of the lab and um, put through more tests to make sure it's still working and giving the same signals that it was with these tests. So I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. Powell and Haley Fong at the University of Memphis. And I'd like to thank Dr. Soren, the director of HERS, and specifically Emily Smith and Mila Shutkovsky for being in my HERS class. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Ella Curlin, and I spent the summer researching and doing outreach about the health and physiology of the wild freshwater turtles at the Memphis Zoo. So uh, I worked with a team from Arkansas State University, and the turtles that we were studying were actually not zoo collection animals. These were wild turtles that just kind of wandered into the zoo and like started living in the ponds or the lakes or maybe like the moats in the animal habitats. And my role in this research primarily had to do with outreach and education. So for animals like turtles, um, these animals are often living in like very close proximity to human environments. And a lot of the threats that they face have to do with that proximity, which is one of the reasons that community based conservation is so important, because when you can increase that awareness in the community for species that are at risk, you really help to mitigate some of the problems that these animals are facing and kind of build a response. So turtles are very ecologically important animals. Um, they play a very large role in processes such as nutrient cycling, especially between water and land habitats. They're also very significant in food webs and they, they can impact their habitats with processes like seed dispersal or germination. They have some unique evolved traits 
they tend to live for very long. They have a very long lifespan. Um, and they have a colonian shell, which has this curved top part called a carapace and a flat underbelly called a plastron. But despite these evolved traits and also the fact that they're so ecologically important, they are coming under a lot of threat from their proximity to human society. So one of these problems is habitat loss or habitat damage due to pollution. Another is the pet trade. So wild turtles might be captured and sold into the pet trade or else um, pet turtles might be released into the public in areas where they're not native and then they become invasive and they threaten local native populations. And a factor in the threats that these animals are facing is what we call the perception of persistence. So because they have such a long lifespan, a lot of the times adult turtles will persist even when the turtle population as a whole is facing major threats. So maybe people in that community might not notice that that uh, turtle population is coming under threat until it's really too late. So for this project, we focused on three primary uh, species of turtle. One is the Mississippi map turtle, which is found primarily in rivers and lakes, especially around the Mississippi River. The other is the river cooter, which can be found especially in the southeastern US in streams and lakes and tends to be shyer of humans. And then the red-eared slider, which uh, can be recognized by those red uh, bars behind the eyes. And it can be found in lakes and in urban areas, especially around people. Both the river cooter and the red-eared slider are very popular pet species. So our capture methods included cast net, weighting, and net traps. So we would throw nets over the edge of the china pond and like try to catch turtles that were maybe floating near the surface. Uh, and you know, for the turtles that didn't work on, we when they drained the china pond, we waded directly in and tried to catch them like with nets. And then we set net traps um, both in the herbitarium pond and the china pond. Once we caught a turtle, we would take a blood sample at a certain like measured time. We would record certain factors like the species, the sex, the weight, and the location of capture, as well as taking a measurement of the shell. The females would be ultrasounded to see if they're going to lay eggs. And then after we involve them in the uh, like outreach activities, we would release them back to the place where we originally caught them. So as we're measuring a turtle, we would use a caliper to determine the length and width of the flat underbelly or the plastron. And then we would use a tape measure to determine the curved length and width of the top part or the carapace. And we would record which turtles were uh, which turtles were which basically by using two methods. There was a permanent ID and a temporary ID. So the permanent ID would be permanently drilled at the edge of the shell. So harmlessly, according to this numbering system. So we have here like turtle 1-19. And then it, there's also a temporary ID to kind of distinguish different incidents of capture. And that's recorded with a number and then a colored Sharpie. So that can be recognized like from the, maybe the outside of the lake. So we know looking down which ones we've already caught. We ended up catching uh, 10 rittered sliders, six river cooters, and there was one Mississippi map turtle. Uh, mostly females, we have 10 females, but there's also four juveniles and three males. Uh, the population seems to maybe have gone up a little bit because we had 15 in 2022 and this year we caught 17. And nine of those were in the China Pond. There were two in the Macaw Pond, which is like right across from the China Pond. There were four living in the moat around the Gibbon exhibit. And then there was one in Teton Trek. So my role primarily had to do with outreach and we would do this by like having props and activities to kind of like interact with guests and explain to them what we're doing, why we're doing it. We would also uh, help guests, you know, interact directly with the turtles, like maybe look at them, maybe touch them. And that way we could explain to them how to recognize different species. And while they're there, they're also going to get like a live demonstration of like if we're throwing the nets or if we're measuring the turtles, they're going to get a live demonstration of what science we're doing as we're like explaining why we're doing it. So that's kind of like the kind that kind of involved science like that involves the community is something that can be really important for promoting awareness of turtles, especially when we're living in such like close proximity to them. So for that reason, uh, I'm continuing to work on producing materials for publication at the zoo or kind of printing at the zoo. Uh, we're going to highlight specific uh, individual turtles that are living in the zoo. So this one's Big Bertha and kind of use that to talk to people about 
different habits they can pick up to make sure that they're being like conscientious of wildlife and how they're impacting, you know, the animals in their community. Yeah. And lastly, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Lori Newman Lee and Jennifer Terry. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Anna Bessoren and uh, Miss Molly Antoine. And I would like to thank my HERS class. Good evening. My name is Isabel Syriac, and over the summer, I had the opportunity to work in Dr. Ranjit Phillips' PDA clinic at Le Bonheur Children's Hospital. More specifically, I worked as the test administrator studying the neurodevelopment outcomes based on the timing of the transcatheter PDA closure in preterm infants. So the patent ductus arteriosus, also commonly known as the PDA, is a major blood vessel located in between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. So the pulmonary artery supplies blood to the lungs while the aorta supplies blood to the rest of the body and the brain. While a fetus is developing, oxygenated blood is sent from the placenta into the baby's bloodstream through the PDA. However, when a baby is born, the PDA is supposed to close to allow oxygenated blood from the lungs to enter the rest of the body. So if the PDA stays open, the less blood goes to the brain and the rest of the body, so that can be problematic, especially for children. While the, P the PDA is most commonly found in preterm infants, due to the fact that they have more, or they're more likely to have underdeveloped organs. So the main symptom used to diagnose the PDA is a heart murmur. A heart murmur is an abnormal or extra sound heard in the heartbeat. And while heart murmurs are usually harmless, it is the number one symptom used to diagnose the PDA. And the way a PDA is closed, there are two methods, but the one used in the PDA clinic was the transcatheter PDA closure, also known as the TCPC procedure. So in this procedure, a cardiologist inserts a catheter up an infant's leg into a blood vessel and moves it up to the heart, ultimately closing the PDA. And this procedure is minimally invasive. So of all the infants that underwent the TCPC procedure, 138 infants who were preterm had follow-up neurobehavioral assessments in the PDA follow-up clinic. So these 138 patients were broken into three groups based on the age of the TCPC procedure. Group one was prior to 30, was group one was before 30 days since birth. Group two was 31 to 60 days since birth. And group three was over 60 days since birth. So the neurobehavioral assessment used to study the neurological outcomes is known as the Vineland Three Adaptive Behavioral Scale. This test assesses the patient's ability to complete day-to-day -day tasks appropriate to their age. So as a test administrator, I had the task of testing patients both in person and virtually. There are three forms, but the one that was used in the PDA clinic is the parent caregiver form. So with the par parent caregiver form, I would contact the parent or guardian of the patients and ask them questions about their child. So the duration and the specificity of the test vary depending on the age of the patient. For a six-month-old, it took me approximately 15 minutes to complete, but for a five-year-old, it took over an hour. And this is due to the differences between their age. So the score that was used to determine the neurological outcomes is known as the Adaptive Behavior Composite Score, also known as the ABC score. The score is broken into three domains, daily living skills, communication, and socialization. The daily living skills domain assesses the patient's ability to complete day-to-day -day tasks, and a sample question is, opens his or her mouth when he or she is being fed. The communication domain assesses the patient's ability to express themselves as well as understand others through speaking, reading, and writing. And a sample question for an infant would be, recognizes family members or other people he or she knows well. Lastly, the socialization domain assesses the patient's ability to interact with others and their other social skills. And a sample question is, plays baby games like peekaboo or patty cake. So the benchmark for this PDA clinic was an ABC score of 70. And this was chosen because it is two standard deviations away from the normative mean, which is 100. So of the 138 patients that underwent the neurobehavioral assessment, only 17 had an ABC score of less than 70, which means that only those patients had obvious abnormal neurological um, outcomes. So as seen in this table, group one, which, was, which had their TCPC procedure, 
less than 30 days since birth, and group two, which had the procedure 31 to 60 days since birth, both scored higher in their composite scores as well as their domain-specific scores than group three, which had their PDA close over 60 days since birth. And this can be attributed to the fact that groups one and group two had their PDA closed before group three. So in conclusion, early TCPC can be associated with neuro improved neurodevelopment outcomes in preterm infants. And in the future, we plan to have serial follow-up neurodevelopment assessments to better understand the long-term differences between each age group. I'd like to thank Dr. Ranjit Philip and the PDA clinic at Lebanon and UTHSC for giving me this opportunity to work over the summer Dr. Annabeth Soren, the director of HERS, for guiding me through this research project. And lastly, I'd, thank to, I'd like to thank my fellow HERS students for helping me better this project. Thank you. Hi, my name is Avery Howell. In this summer, I got to work at the University of Memphis in the psychology department, specifically in the gambling addiction lab. My project was on the financial distress due to gambling addiction. Addiction is a behavior over which an individual has impaired control with harmful consequences. Traditionally, as addiction has been talked about in the literature, it is only referred to drugs and alcohol. But more recently, other types of addiction have been able to come into the, um, the talk as well. For example, um, disordered gambling, which is when an individual experiences some kind of loss of control over gambling, has become more prevalent. Just in 2013, in the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for, Men for Mental Disorders, it was moved from the Impulse Control section to the Addiction um, Disorder section. Uh, disordered gambling can be anything pertaining to lotteries, sports betting, casinos, and anything like that. And globally, the problem has become more prevalent as about 1.5% of adults experiences pro experience problem gambling, but that number varies per country. For South Africa, Australia, the United States, that number is greater. So currently, financial distress is the, um, is the biggest consequence of gambling addiction, but currently in the literature, it is not clearly defined and there's no clear way to measure it. So our research question was asking how we've been talking about it thus far and what we're describing when we say financial distress. Our goals to see, are to, were to see what's already in the literature, figure out how to measure it and how to involve it in treatment. Because as individuals experience this kind of distress, there are so many different degrees of severity as they experience it. For example, one person may experience this distress when they start falling behind on bills or if they have to borrow money for a friend, but another might not experience it even if they have to file for bankruptcy or take out another mortgage on their home. So we are working to figure out how to measure it accurately to better treat people um, when they come in for treatment. We started this process with a scoping review, which is a review of the literature to see what's already there. To do this, we followed the PRISMA guidelines for scoping reviews, which are basically just the guidelines that help us report accurate data in a way that is easily read and easily, easily used in the future to prevent the replication crisis, making sure that any further research that's done can, be advan can advance and not start from square one. To start this, we just entered various search terms in multiple databases. And to do this, we use the Boolean model. This is an efficient search method often used by researchers to be able to search for lots of different articles and types of articles all at once. So we use the operators and or and not. And so you can see here, um, using the term and allows you to search for two terms within articles at once. So for example, we were able to search for the term gambling and financial distress within an article and not just one or the other, whereas or would be searching for one or the other and not would it be excluding terms. So here were our key terms that we put into the databases. And so you can see the importance of um, using the parentheses and quotation marks to group. And to, we used asterisks to be able to search for multiple, we, to be able to search with the root, ter root term of the word and find lots of different versions of the word. So for example, using this allows us to look for the term gamble, gambler, gambling, and not um, limit our search. Once we had entered our key terms into our three databases, we were left with about 2,900 articles. So this is just a small screenshot of the large spreadsheet that we made. Um, we coded it to have all 20 of our um, key terms to see which key terms were appearing in which articles. And this allowed us to see patterns along um, within the articles to see what kinds of um, key terms were giving us what kinds of articles. 
Um, after we've done that, we combined our articles to remove all the duplicates between the different databases, leaving us with just under 2,000 articles. And that's when we went through all the articles, looking at their title and abstract to make notes to be able to create exclusion and inclusion criteria. And this just means that we were finding ways or finding reasons to include or exclude articles to narrow them down to the most relevant and beneficial articles for our final project. So here's a summary version of what our inclusion exclusion criteria was. So just as an example for this first bullet point, um, if we found an article that had to do with public health but just mentioned gambling and gambling wasn't the focus of the article, we could easily exclude it. If gambling was the focus, then we would include it. And or yes, and then for exclusion, if adults, our project was focused on adults and gambling addiction. So if it pertained to adults and adolescents and children, we um, excluded it. Um, here is a, just a spreadsheet just to show that it's just a part of a spreadsheet to show how this um, process works. So you can easily see, um, you can easily go through these and see that there's a one under English because that's the reason we excluded the article because it was written in Czech. In conclusion, this project is still ongoing. We were not able to finish it in the summer. My mentor is still working hard. Um, the, final, uh, the final goal of this project is to, of course, define the term financial distress and create a scale, which may be taking ideas from other fields or maybe starting from scratch. But this scale will be able to better and more accurately assess an individual's financial distress when they come in seeking treatment so that their um, recovery from gambling addiction can, um, better, can be better suited to them. I'd like to thank the directors of the Gambling Addiction Lab, Dr. Whalen and Dr. Rory Fund. Um, thank you, Hallie Smith, who's a St. Mary's alum, currently a master's student at U of M, and the rest of the lab, as well as Dr. Soren and her, my fellow her students for helping me throughout this process. Hello, my name is Caroline Hunt, and this summer I worked in the computer science department at University of Memphis to categorize radiology reports using artificial intelligence. The larger project I was working under would be to create an artificial intelligence model that would read the radiology images and generate a text report similarly to how a doctor would. But to solve this problem, we had to break it down into its parts, so we first decided to start by teaching an AI model to understand the, term, the terms. So AI's application to medicine is really important because it can help to decrease the cost of medical care, and it can also make medicine a lot more efficient. For example, we could implement e-medical care, which would allow you to decrease the amount of time required to get in to see specialists. And also it can increase the efficiency of radiology in general by, increasing the time, by decreasing the time it takes to get the reports back from a scan. From a scan. So when we talk about AI, a lot of the times we think of the scary things that are in the dystopian movies, and this is an example of one of them from HAL from 2001 A Space Odyssey. But what we're really referring to is the simulation of intelligent behavior in computers. Artificial intelligence also has many other branches, and they're all used together to solve complex problems. The first branch that I worked with this summer is called machine learning, and this is just generally turning experience into knowledge. And that experience is in the form of data that is given to the model by a, by a researcher. And the model is teaching itself that concept based on the data that it's given. And this is the basic building block of pretty much the other branches of AI. Deep learning is machine learning just on a more complex scale. Its purpose is to perform very complex tasks. So a deep learning model would be able to break a very complex task down, like making a booking in your calendar, into each of the steps required to do that without being told each of the steps. Natural language processing is the final branch of AI that I worked with this summer, and this is just teaching computers to speak and understand natural human language. The two tasks that I worked with this summer specifically are prediction of disease and sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis refers to reading tone from a text. And so the AI model that I created this summer was going to be able to identify words and categorize a report from, that, from those words as normal or abnormal. To do my research, I worked with two different data sets this summer, the first of which is the MIMIC CXR data set, and it's of chest x-rays, as you can see here at the bottom. Um, it's columns in the data set that I, were, that I was given is the image path, which creates the images like this the report that was generated by the doctor, the binary label that shows whether the report was normal or abnormal, uh, the multi-label column shows what was abnormal about the data, and then the gender column shows the gender of the patient. The second data that I worked with is the IU x-ray data set, and this is also of chest x-rays, as you can see down here. 
Um, and the columns of this data set are exactly the same as the first one. For my research this summer, the two columns that I focused on were the report column, which were my inputs, and the binary label column, which were my outputs. The type of AI model that I worked with this summer is called a neural network. And a neural network is used in deep learning, and it is usually a very complex model with hundreds of thousands of layers. But a basic neural network requires three layers. The input layer, which takes in the data, the output layer, which gives an answer, and then the hidden layer. The hidden layer acts as the neurons and connections between neurons in our brains and allows the model to do complex calculations in order to come up with an output. When we apply a model to data, we don't uh, apply it to the whole data set. We, make, we put sections of the data together depending on, what our, depending on what our task is. So when we train the data, we use the first 70% of the data, and that's where the model learns the patterns. The next 20% of the data is used for validation, and this is to get initial results in order to update the model and make it more accurate. And then the test set is the last 10% of the data, and this is where we get our final results from. The specific neural network that I worked with this summer is called the clinical BERT model. It is a pre-trained model, and it's pre-trained on general medical terms, so anywhere from pharma pharmaceutical definitions to general medical reports. So we decided to use this model because it would be more efficient to make this model specific to radiology. And so this model is what is known as a reinforcement learning model, which means that it's given the inputs and based on its output, whether it's correct or incorrect, it will get positive or negative feedback so that the model can fine tune itself and adjust some of its calculations to get a more accurate answer the next time. This image down here is some of the parameters that I use to make the model more specific to my tasks. For example, it talks about whether uh, this, this line right here talks about how much of the data it's looking at at a time. And this one here talks about how quickly it moves through each of those groups of data. To evaluate the model, I used two metrics. The first was the accuracy score, which is the percentage of the time that the model predicted the value correctly, and the loss function, which is the percentage of the variation in the predicted versus the actual values. So the results that I had for the IU X-ray data set, my accuracy was 71%. My loss was 46%. For the MIMIC data set, the test accuracy was 78% and the loss was 10%. All four of these values are accepted values in the industry, and these very high accuracies show that AI is on its way to being used in more mainstream contexts. For next steps in the project, we would build an image identification model in order to sort radi radiographs just based on whether they were normal or abnormal. And then we would be able to put these together in order to associate the terms with what is seen on the radiology image. When talking about artificial intelligence and medicine, there's a lot of ethical concerns that can come up. So this was the last part of my project. So whenever you're dealing with artificial intelligence, there's always going to be bias because you're coming from your perspective and you may not consider other perspectives. The agent of responsibility is also something that's super important. It, it talks about who is responsible if something goes wrong. Would it be the doctor who decided to implement the AI, the hospital, or the person who created the model? And because we don't have answers to these questions yet, it makes federal regulation of artificial intelligence very difficult or more difficult than it normally would be. And so until we have answers to these questions, it's very difficult to properly and, and fairly regulate artificial intelligence. I would like to thank Dr. Huang of the University of Memphis Computer Science Department, uh, the graduate student UXN that I worked with, Dr. Soren, Ms. Antoine, Mother Miranda, and my fellow HER students. Um, hello, my name is Isabel Isaacs, and over the summer, I worked at the University of Memphis in the Department of Psychology in the REACH Lab and with Dr. Hassell, and I worked on the implementation of dialectical behavior therapy into high schools for social and emotional learning. So social and emotional learning are mental and physical health courses in schools, and they range from grade levels all the way from kindergarten to high school, and they're needed to set a foundation for social and emotional skills for students during times of transition. And there's a common misconception that um, SEL programs are only needed or used for uh, elementary level students, but this is not true. Adolescents may need SEL even more because of the high sensitivity to emotions during this time. And um, although there are standards in the US in all states for SEL programs for elementary level, not all states have these standards for adolescent level courses. Um, and even if they do, for example, in Tennessee, a lot of the times these courses can feel ingenuine. Um, but over COVID, there was a 
spotlight on mental health because of the decrease in adolescent mental health. So this shows on the graph that before COVID, a lot of the times people thought the focus on SEL programs for adolescents was very, very low. But after COVID and after the severe decrease in mental health, there's been more focus on um, adolescents' mental health in social and emotional programs. So this is where the specifics on a specific course may come into play. So dialectical behavior therapy is a six month long therapy for adolescents who have experienced depression or suicidal ideation. And there are four main skills of it. Interpersonal effectiveness is one's ability to manage their relationships. Uh, emotion regulation is one's ability to manage their emotions on a daily basis. Distress tolerance is one's ability to manage their um, emotions during a time of high distress. And mindfulness is one's ability to ground themselves in a present moment to know how they're feeling presently and not in the past or the future. And it was discovered in 2016 that these four main skills don't only apply to adolescents with mental health disorders, but can also be generalized to adolescents throughout the schools. So that's when DBT Steps A, or Dialectical Behavior Therapy, Skills Training for Emotional Problem Solving for Adolescents, adolescents was created. Um, and so that's what my mentor was studying. So specifically over the summer, I uh, did a meta-analysis, work with a meta-analysis, and then I also transcri transcribed focus groups. So for the meta-analysis, a meta-analysis is pretty much gathering research articles on a specific similar topic to see what has already been achieved or done. So what I did was I was given articles by my mentor and I would read them and I would code different parts of them, like the, if there was a control group or the age or the grade in the intervention or the school type, just to see what has been done in all in one place. And then I transcribed focus groups. So my mentor, my mentor had been doing focus groups across Memphis because a lot of the research that has been done for DBT Steps A has been in majority rural white populations, while in Memphis, the, it's majority African-American urban population. So we needed to see if the, the DBT Steps A would still work in this different um, racial climate. So um, my mentor had been doing the focus groups and around five to six students across Memphis City Public Schools. She would sit down and have an audio recording with the students, and first she would start off with mindfulness, and then she would ask the students about common stressors in their lives to get them started talking about their common issues and uh, stressors, and then she would ask about the four main uh, parts of DBT to get their feedback and responses. So in my transcription that I, that I did, a lot of the common responses and problems were familial stressors, while familial pressures while also being limited by society racially. Um, and then a student feedback on interpersonal effectiveness was the students said that this could help them have the hard conversations. For distress tolerance, the students said this could help with their self-control. For emotional regulation, the students said this could help with their confidence. And for mindfulness, the students said this could help with their self-awareness and that the most important thing for mindfulness was a willingness to try because they said a lot of the times it can feel silly. So because of the positive feedback, um, despite cultural differences, it was shown that DBT Steps A could be a good program for Memphis City Public Schools and social and emotional learning. So my mentor's future plans are to conduct more focus groups to get more information and more of a foundation for her research. And then she plans to have an intervention in a Memphis City public school where she actually in implements DBT Steps A and research to see if it will work. And then if it does, then implement it into more Memphis City public schools for SEL. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Hassell, Dr. Soren, Miss Antoine, and my fellow HERS students. Hi, my name is Mary Kit Kaladimos, and this past summer I worked in Dr. LaBelle's lab at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital on the in vitro and in vivo characterizations of two osteosarcoma cell lines. So the LaBelle lab focuses a lot on cancer metastasis, and this happens when cells from the primary tumor invade the blood vessels, circulate through the bloodstream, and then they invade a new tissue at a distal site. And this is important because once cancer metastasizes, the treatments that are available, some of them no longer are no longer available, and the chance of survival decreases very rapidly. So the p53 gene it codes for the p53 protein, which is a tumor suppressor in our bodies. 
And the two cell lines that I worked with were AX and the AXT cell lines. So the AX cell line has a single mutation for the P53 protein, but the AXT cell line has a double mutation for the P53 protein. So going into the, these experiments, we kind of already had an understanding that the AXT cells would be a little bit more aggressive than the AX. And osteosarcoma is cancer that originates in bone cells, and it's really common in children and young adults, so it's a big focus at St. Jude. And when osteosarcoma metastasizes, it typically does so in the lungs because of the small, fine capillaries that are in the lungs. So cancer cells get stuck in there very easily. So the methods that I used, the first one was proliferation, and this measures the cell growth of the cells. And we used a cell titer glow assay, which reads the luminescence of the cells. So we measured it at 24, 48, and 72 hours to assess the cell growth. And with migration, we used a two-chamber plate with a filter in between. So in the top chamber, we put cells with no serum in it, so no nutrients. And then in the bottom chamber, we put 5% fetal bovine serum, which is the nutrients that the cells need. And after 48 after 24 hours, we imaged the cells of the bottom chamber to see how many cells move from the top chamber to the bottom chamber in order to get food. And with invasion, we performed the same procedure. However, we added a layer of collagen to the top chamber. Um, and this further assesses the cell's tendency to move to get um, nutrients. And then with the spheroid cell viability assay, um, we used an ultra-low attachment plate, so this meant that the cells were not anchored down to the bottom of the plate, and instead they were anchored to themselves. And this is really important because when cells are circulating through the bloodstream, they have no structure to anchor down to like they do with the primary tumor. And this further assesses the cell's viability and their ability to metastasize. And then finally, we used in vivo lung metastasis, so we injected 1 million cells via tail vein into uh, C57 black 6 mice. And after 14 days, we collected their lungs, froze them, sectioned them, and we performed H&E staining to view the metastases. So with migration invasion and spheroid, we show, it showed no significance. But with proliferation, the AXT cells proliferated much faster than the AX cells did. And with the in vivo lung metastasis, the AX had very little metastasis, but the AXTs had a lot of meta much more metastases than the AXT uh, than the AXs did. And so this shows us that the main difference of these two cell lines is the proliferation rate. And this is important because now we know that even though their migratory abilities are the same, once the AXT cells get to the lungs, they grow much faster. And so going forward, we would like to assess more uh, experiments on the proliferation differences of the AX and the AXT cell lines. And by looking at these in vitro, we hope that we can get a better understanding of them in vivo, and we can come up with more treatments to help prevent the metastases and also to help per, uh, suppress the metastases once it does happen. And I would li like to thank my PI, Dr. Miriam LaBelle, and I'd like to thank my three mentors, Dr. Akshita Bahat, Dr. Benjamin Minden Birkenmeyer, and Dr. Olivia Travis, and I would like to thank Dr. Annabeth Soren for, my, for being the director of HERS and my HERS 2023 cohort. Hi, I'm Erica Ormseth, and this summer I conducted research at the Computer Science Department at the University of Memphis on improving graduate TA feedback on students' computer code. So a TA is typically a graduate teaching assistant, and they assist professors in, ass in activities like teaching lectures and grading papers. Um, however, there are many problems with current TA training, one of which is that many universities are under-equipped with the facilities and resources needed to effectively train their TAs. And similarly, many professors lack the time and incentives incentives themselves to train their TAs. Um, the TAs involved in my research um, assist professors in introductory to computer science courses. So much of their work as a TA um, includes providing feedback on student computer code. <clears throat> so in conducting research on improving TA feedback, um, I had to evaluate hundreds and hundreds of lines of student of TA feedback. And to do that, I had to learn something called the code book, which is a standardized set of eight categories that we use to evaluate TA feedback. 
Um, and the codebook provides definitions and examples for each of these. So I had to learn the codebook, and then once I did that, I practiced. And I practiced on about 150 or so lines of pre-coded TA feedback. And I practiced this until I reached an 85% agreement, 85% um, according to the pre-classifications of, of this set of TA feedback. So once I reached that 85% agreement, um, I was considered sufficiently trained to classify TA feedback on my own. So that is what I did. As you can see here, this is a lot of lines of TA feedback under the eight categories that I classified them as. And I did this for about 640 or so lines of TA feedback. And this can be used to evaluate TA's improvements on their feedback. And it can also be used for further research to actually better train TAs um, themselves. However, obviously that was a lot and it was very time consuming. So I tried to see if I could use AI to more efficiently classify TA feedback. So to do this, I used a large language model, which is a generative AI model, which is similar to what is more commonly known as chat GBT. Um, and to do this, we gave the model different prompts and we use one line of feedback at a time with only one category at a time, just to try and see how we could start off getting the model to classify the TA feedback for us. Um, so to do this at first, I started with zero shot learning and zero shot learning is essentially providing the model with just a definition of what the category is. So for example, it, we use prescriptive first and prescriptive means that the TA told the programmer exactly how to modify their code. So all we did here is we told the model what classifies a line of feedback as prescriptive and then um, it did not work. It was inaccurate and inconsistent. So then we moved to few shot learning. And few shot learning is different than zero shot learning because not only does few shot learning provide a definition for the category that we want to use to classify a line of feedback, it also provides examples of um, a correct classification of that line of feedback. So that's what we did here. And it was much, much better than the zero shot learning. However, it was still very inaccurate and also inconsistent. So to try and make that better, we moved to using few shot learning with a loop. And essentially what a loop, how a loop differentiates between what we did before is that a loop runs individually for each line of feedback that is provided. Um, and this proved to be much more accurate and consistent. There was still um, a little bit of inconsistencies, but overall it was much better than having the program run once for all the lines of feedback together. Um, however, using loop, because it does require the the program to run individually for each line of feedback, it does end up being much more expensive and time consuming. Um, so although this is great and it was much better at classifying the feedback, it in the long run with large scale numbers of feedback would not be um, very effective because it require, it's very time consuming and expensive. So in conclusion, um, the AI classification did work, but it was inconsistent. So our next steps are to try and to continue to build a large language model that will be able to reliably classify TA feedback for us. And with that, we will also try to build a machine learning model to classify TA feedback. And hopefully we will be able to use one of those to um, actually build a system that will itself improve TA feedback. And how the system will do that is by when a TA submits a line of feedback, the system will evaluate it under the eight categories. And if it is shown to be a non-effective line of feedback, line of TA feedback, um, the system will tell the TA X, Y, Z is wrong with the feedback. Would you like to adjust it or submit it anyways? And the TA can override the system or um, adjust their line of feedback. And over time, this will improve TA training and improve the feedback that they give on student computer code. I would like to thank my mentors, Dr. Amy Cook and Dr. Alistair Winster. Um, I would also like to thank Ms. Molly Anton, um, who helped me gather sources for my paper, Dr. Annabeth Soren, and my fellow HERS classmates. My name is Anna Raza, and I studied the effect of early life stress on parenting behavior in B6 mice in the psychology department at the University of Memphis. So studies on early life stress are relatively new because they stem from the observation that the offspring of survivors of traumatic stressful events, such as World War II and the Holocaust, 
were experiencing similar levels of psychopathology than their parents. And psychopathology refers to the group of mental disorders such as depression, anxiety, and PTSD. And so because the offspring of the survivors were experiencing similar levels of psychopathology led to the conclusion that changes in gene expression from stressful experiences could be passed on through generations. And we refer to this phenomenon as generational trauma. However, the extent to which the gene expression is inherited and exactly how it's being inherited are still being studied. But what we do know is that it's a combination of social factors and epigenetic mechanisms. And epigenetics refers to the how our environment regulates our gene expression. And one of the primary social factors that contributes to our offspring behavior is parenting quality, which is why we're studying that. So to understand the effect of early life stress on parenting quality, it's important to understand stress, the types of stress, and how we experience stress. So stress is defined as a state of worry or mental tension caused by a difficult situation, according to the World Health Organization. And there are two types of stress, chronic and acute stress. But to understand the difference, it's important to understand the difference between stress and distress. So stress is when your behavior is adaptable to the situation and it doesn't produce a long lasting effect. And we often see that with acute stress because acute stress is for a shorter amount of time. However, in, with the distress, our behaviors become maladaptive and they often produce a long lasting effect. And we often see that with chronic stress because chronic stress is for a longer duration of time. And the mice in this experiment were exposed to a four week chronic stress paradigm with five days of consecutive stressors and two days of rest. So these stressors included things such as a cage tilt or a damp cage, things that would cause the mice to experience distress. And this mice were stressed at around 42 days old, and then they were inbred with each other at around 73 days old, and then we recorded their parenting quality with their offspring. And so to understand the effect of early life stress on parenting quality, it's important to understand how stress during pregnancy or perinatal stress, um, it's important to understand the effects of perinatal stress. So with perinatal stress, multiple studies have shown that it produces intense um, effects such as increases in psychopathology, low birth weights, disruptions in fetal development and cognitive functioning, and an overall decrease in parent-pup interactions. And so because we're focusing on prenatal stress, which is stress before pregnancy, we're expecting to see some of the same similar effects with an overall decrease in parent-pup interactions, but just not as intense. And so there are two ways we measure nest qual there are two ways we measure parenting quality, nest building and pup retrieval. I mainly focus on nest building and I use Boris, which is an animal coding software to code these nest building videos. And in the nest building videos, the dam, which is the mom, and the sire, which is the dad, are placed into a new cage with their offspring and with paper straw material to mimic nest building material. And then their interactions with their offspring are recorded for an hour. And then when we code this video, we code it one time through through the dam's perspective and then one time through through the sire's perspective. And then we classify these codes as either good parenting behaviors or bad parenting behaviors. And good parenting behaviors are behaviors interact um, directed toward interacting with the offspring, whereas bad parenting behaviors are directed towards interacting away from the offspring. And so latency is the time till first contact with the offspring and partner interactions are classified as good because they provide us insight into how much um, the dam and sire are interacting with each other to take care of their offspring. And the difference between escaping and exploring and rearing is that rearing is a point event, which means we record it once when they put their paws up. However, escaping and exploring is a state event, which means we record it when they start actively trying to leave the cage or they're hanging on the sides of the cage, and then we record when it ends. And so over here, we have two um, footages from the nest building videos. So over here, we can see that the mom is actively trying to escape, which is a bad pairing behavior. And then over here, we can see the mom directly interacting with the offspring, which is good. And we also see over here a nest being formed, which is also important because at the end of two weeks, the lab measures nest quality, which is based on how well the nest is designed to protect the pups from the outside environment.
And so over here, we have the results from a nest building video that I coded and the nest quality. And so over here, we can see that the dam interacted more with her offspring than the sire, and that rearing happened a significant more times than the other events because it's a point event. And then over here, we see the differences in nest quality between the red, which is the chronic stress group, and the blue, which is our control group. And so you can see that there's no statistical difference between the two, meaning that the effects of early life stress had no significant impact on parenting quality in regards to nest building. And then the other way we measure parenting quality is pup retrieval, but pup retrieval is a more direct way to actually me measure maternal quality because it only involves the mom. And we code latency again, and then we also code retrieval, which is the time to place the first pup into the nest. And so over here, we have on average across all the control groups and all the chronic stress groups, the average latency to successfully retrieve a pup and the average latency to first contact. And so over here, we can see that there's no statistical significance between the two. Um, and over here, we can see that there, once again, although statistically insignificant, the chronic stress group did retrieve their pups and less time indicating a slightly better parenting quality. However, um, and this could be due to the resilience the chronic stress group developed because of the early life stress. So the effect of having their offspring outside of their nest didn't affect them as much as the control group, or it could be what we refer to as helicopter parenting in humans, but that is still being studied. And so because the effects of early life stress on parenting quality in regards to nest building and pup retrieval were statistically insignificant, our next steps are to examine our offspring behavior. And if we notice a statistical significance between the offspring behavior of the control group and the chronic stress group, the next question we have to answer is, if it's not stress-induced changes to parenting behavior that's causing these changes, then what is changing offspring behavior? And I'd like to thank Chris Hartless and Dr. Melanie Cook, Dr. Annabeth Soren, and all my fellow HER students. Hi, my name is Ellis Rougeau, and this summer I studied in anti-selectivity for pharmaceutical design in the Garner Lab at the University of Memphis. So, Chemical composition is important to consider when formulating drugs because it defines the way they interact with receptors within the body. And many pharmaceutical compounds are chiral, meaning they contain four different groups attached to one central atom. And chiral compounds exhibit mirrored co configurations called enantiomers, labeled either R or S, depending on their physical orientation. And so we can think of enantiomers like our hands, our hands are not superimposable, but they are mirror images of each other. So, um, enantiomers are, they have identical properties except in chiral environments. So we can think of the chiral environment like the gloves. So our left hand can only fit in the left glove and our right hand can only fit in a right glove. And in the same way, each enantiomer can only bind to its corresponding receptor in a chiral environment. And then this shows two identical molecules. They're superimposable and not mirror images of each other. And this shows enantiomers, which are mirror images of each other. So in pharmaceuticals, the enantiomer responsible for the desired effect of a medication is called the utomer, and the other enantiomer is called the distomer. And distomers can be inert, meaning they have no effect, or they can cause side effects. So ibuprofen or Advil is an example of a medication that has an inactive distomer, so it, it doesn't cause any side effects. And it's racemic, meaning it's 50% utomer and 50% distomer, but inside of our bodies, that ratio shifts, and over half of the utomer is converted to distomer. So even though the distomer has no effect, it's important to consider for dosage. So on the other hand, thalidomide is an example of a medication with a harmful distomer, so the distomer causes side effects. So thalidomide was a sedative in the 1950s prescribed to pregnant women to help with nausea, and it became clear when these women started giving birth that the distomer was harmful because their children were being born with limb deformities. And so as a result of this, strict regulations were put in place for pharmaceutical testing, and there was a new need to be able to isolate or favor the utomer over the distomer 
to enhance the positive effects of a medication. And we can do this with chiral reagents, which favor the conversion of one enantiomer to another. So the purpose of my research this summer was to determine if chiral chloroborane, which is a chiral reagent, would be effective in favoring one enantiomer over the other for use in drugs. So for the experiment itself, we synthesized nine dienes into racemic and non-racemic diols, which are compounds containing two alcohols. And the racemic solutions samples, sorry, the racemic samples were synthesized with borane dimethyl sulfate and maintained the 50-50 enantiomer ratio and that acted as the control. And then the non-racemic samples were synthesized with the chloroborane and exhibited the ratio each dial would in a chiral environment like our bodies. So we chemically derived these 18 dials to prepare them for analysis. And the first kind of analysis we did was mass spectroscopy, which tells us about the constituent masses inside of the compound and helps us confirm that we synthesized the correct thing. And then we did gas chromatography, which tells us the temperature at which components of the sample vaporize. And because this column on our gas chromatograph was chiral, we could see the separation of the enantiomers on the spectra, which is the output information. So here are some examples of some gas chromatography spectra. And on the left, this is the spectra from a racemic dial, and on the right is its non-racemic counterpart. So on the racemic spectra, we can see these groups of peaks with similar areas, and we identify those as the enantiomers, and then note the time and temperature they were vaporized at, and compare that time and temperature for the non-racemic. And as we can see, um, the upper peak got smaller and the lower peak got larger. So we represent this change in ratio with enantiomeric excess. And so the greater the difference between these two peaks, the more effective the chloroborine would be. So those spectra were actually the most successful spectra we had. The rest of them looked a lot more like these, where we couldn't identify the enantiomer pair from the spectra or its corresponding for the non-racemic. And so because of that, the derivations were largely unsuccessful and we could not get enantiomeric excess values. For the next steps, we looked into NMR, which is nuclear magnetic resonance. And this is a picture of an NMR machine. And that's an analytical method that tells us about the fingerprint of a molecule by identifying all of its hydrogens and or carbons. Um, but it's not chiral, so we had to conduct experiments to be able to see the enantiomers. And I worked on this a little bit at the end of my research and it wasn't looking very promising. So what we'd really like to do is HPLC, which is high performance liquid chromatography. And it, it's like gas chromatography, but it analyzes the sample as a liquid rather than a gas, which would be more precise for our samples. Thank you for listening, and thank you to Dr. Gardner and soon to be Dr. Von Dahlen, Dr. Soren, Ms. Dunlap, and my fellow Hersers. Hello, my name is Rebecca Schweitzer, and over the summer I conducted research with my mentor, Dr. Courtney Melton Fant, in the Univer University of Memphis School of Public Health studying the effect of race on the use of research evidence in the Tennessee State Legislature. And why this project was so important is because although there is an abundance of literature studying the use of research evidence in not only state but also federal legislatures, mo much of it lacks criticality or the use of critical theories, which allows the research to take into account societal systems and structures that affect it. And so in the Tennessee legislature specifically, the identities of the legislators are going to determine how they utilize evidence in their deliberations because of where those identities place them on that hierarchical scale. And so the first theory that we utilized was critical race theory, and there were tenants that were most relevant to our project. The first being the ordinariness of racism, which states that although it can be underlying, racism is prominent in our day-to-day -day lives every day. And the second being the voice of color thesis, which names that people of color have an intrinsic ability to speak on their experience with race and racism that their white counterparts do not share because they lack that history of oppression. The second theory was the theory of racialized organizations, which states that organizations are racialized structures 
and they act under foundations and processes and hierarchies that don't value all individuals at the same level. The two concepts that were most relevant were whiteness as a credential, a little self-explanatory, but just the plain state of being white places you at an advantageous um, state um, in terms of access to resources and um, power. And secondly, being the interpretation of whiteness as normative and neutral. And especially we see this in the Tennessee state legislature as it is a white male Republican supermajority. So anything outside of white is seen as abnormal and not the default. So first I watched session videos for, I was mainly working on the ESA bill, um, but I will explain both of them briefly. The first policy was the K through 12 education savings account or the ESA bill, which is a sort of a voucher program. So funding that would go to a, go towards a student's public education um, can be used to go to a student going to an independent or private educational option. And it really is um, emphasized to promote parental choice. And specifically in Tennessee, it was targeted at low income students and the districts that it ended up landing on in Memphis and Nashville ended up being majority students of color and black students. And secondly, the temporary assistance for needy families policy um, was that Tennessee had the largest reserves in the country of a policy of this kind. And so they needed to get rid of that surplus. So as I watch these videos, it is important um, for the nature of this study as qualitative to keep track of our reflexive journals. So this was not only to use to note our initial um, observations and reactions as we watch the videos, but also to note any opinions or biases that we are um, bringing to the analysis as people. And the coding that I would later do was on transcripts of these videos, but why the videos were important was because we were also noting the expression and tone and behavior of the legislators as they debated. So examples of our codes, um, one of them was type of evidence. So statistical fact could be something like a percentage of students on track in a subject. And we saw an abundance of narrative and anecdotes, which could be a legislator talking about their personal experience um, with the Tennessee education system, or um, maybe someone they know or a family member. Use of evidence, <clears throat> um, political may be to advocate for the specific bill, um, advocate for or against, and then tactical could be to um, speed up or slow down the um, traction of that bill, um, which could, for instance, be noting that maybe there's not enough evidence for deliberations to continue. Use of racialized evidence, use of racialized language um, could be either explicit or implicit. Explicit use would be students of color or black students or African-American students, and implicit would be low income or economically disadvantaged students. Valence, pretty self-explanatory if the evidence was either being presented neutrally or in support or opposition of that policy. Source, so generic would be if the speaker said, I read a study or research or a report with no specifics. And then lastly, the interpretation would be what if any claims were made. So this could be suggesting an objective status of the problem like low ACT scores, or it could even be suggesting a policy problem with that specific policy that they're debating. So the data is still being analyzed and much of the work I was doing was sort of the beginning steps of the project. However, and as the project continues, we'll be able to draw some more um, concrete conclusions and statistics. However, there were some commonalities that we were seeing. So first being the general lack of evidence in the deliberations. So much of the time in order to track the academic achievement and determine whether or not these students are doing uh, better or worse in their new environments. Um, quantitative metrics like graduation rates and ACT scores were used. However, it, the evidence that they were using failed to um, account for the experiential and social aspect of this um, educational switch. And since the Tennessee bill specifically, um, the areas that it ended up targeting um, were predominantly students of color, it is really important to 
take into account that racial and socioeconomic difference of that change in environment. Um, we also saw multiple instances in some of the session videos that I watched of black male legislators being cut off and given time limits compared to their white counterparts when they would go on the same um, anecdotal tangents or ask very hypothetical questions. And lastly, we saw that black female legislators were using evidence in a unique way compared to their counterparts. So two um, black female Democratic um, senators specifically we saw, and it's important to note that they hold a triple minority status in the Tennessee state legislature. Um, the first one we saw employ very empirical and objective evidence um, about a educational program implemented in her district in Memphis. And the second, although she employed anecdotal evidence, um, sorry, <laughs> although she employed anecdotal evidence, most of the anecdotal evidence and narratives we saw being used in debates were coming from wealthy white legislators speaking on their experience, maybe changing the school of their child or switching to homeschooling, while the black female senator gave her, uh, shared her black son's experience switching from a public school in Memphis to a predominantly white um, private school in the Memphis suburbs. And this demonstrated the voice of color thesis and also that as the white legislators were uh, naming their experiences, that whiteness was seen as the default because they were not even um, acknowledging that their experiences were off the demographic that was being targeted with this bill. So I look forward to the results as the project continues. And I would like to thank my mentor, Dr. Courtney Melton Thant, Dr. Soren, and my HERS cohort. Um, my name is Rhea Sharma, and I got the opportunity to work at Dr. Lester's lab at University of Memphis in the Department of Psychology. And the project that we focus on was social reward processing in males and females. The overarching interest of the lab is addiction and specifically what factors alter reward processing. And what reward processing is specifically is the process by which we associate certain stimuli with a positive or negative effect. And that ties back to addiction because addiction is a form of dysfunctional reward processing. And the idea that self-administration of the drug becomes repetitive despite all consequences. And we have different things that we classify as rewards in our everyday life. So standard stimuli could be TV, food, and attraction. And the basis for what classifies each of these as rewards is the level of dopamine release in our brain. Because dopamine releases a feeling of euphoria and drives our motivation. And all of these standard stimuli um, uh, release a standard level of dopamine in our brains. Whereas when you look at drugs, a higher, a higher level of dopamine is released in our brains which then makes our relationship with drug as a reward far stronger than standard stimuli. So the reason why we're studying social reward is because past studies have shown that social experiences play a role in altering reward processing. And specifically, social isolation has been heavily correlated with um, specific, has been heavily correlated with increased drug seeking and increased seeking in things that um, elicit higher dopamine levels. And what my portion of the project specifically focused on was whether or not males and females differ in the way they go about social interactions and the role that plays in and whether or not they find um, social interactions more or less rewarding. So the way we went about the procedures, we started off by making a social pair. And the social pair consisted of one conspecific mouse and one experimental mouse. And the experimental mouse was the mouse that we observed all the social interactions from the perspective of. And the social pair was made, made based off of both mices having, both mouses having uh, been of the same mass, same sex, and of the same strain of mouse. And so before we started their social interactions, we placed the experimental mouse in the chamber with a slight divider with a hallway allowing for the experimental mouse to go from both sides of the chamber. And that way we were able to determine the experimental mouse's side of preference. And that way we can make these social interactions take place in the experimental mouse's side of least preference to make sure that that wasn't a factor in the way they went about social interactions. And so the social interactions took place across four different days and um, this was recorded for 15 minutes. And then th that footage was then taken for video analysis, which is primarily what I worked on this summer. And so the first step of video analysis was to take the raw footage and put it into the Zoom software to mark the experimental mouse. And this is important because 
the experimental mouse and the conspecific mouse look very similar. And in order to view things from the experimental mouse's perspective, you have to be able to differentiate them. So I looked at um, around four hours of footage for each social day that I analyzed. And uh, that included multiple social pairs and multiple social interactions. After the experimental mouse was um, marked in the Zoom in the Zoom recordings, it was then taken to the Boris software where you correlate keys one through eight with specific social interactions that occur between the experimental mouse and the conspecific mouse. And as soon as you see them occur, you press the key that correlates with the specific function. Like for an example, off to uh, the left, I have put the two most common um, the two most common interactions, which is the sniff head head and sniff head genital. And these are from the perspective of the experimental mouse. And so as soon as I saw one of these interactions occur, I would press that key and then I'd press it again when it ends. And as you can see off to the right, that would create a log and that is what we use for our results. And so the results from our social trials showed that on the day one, male and female mice went about social interactions in the same way. However, by day four, um, females were shown to interact less than males. So the next step is to take these differences that we see in the way males and females go about social interactions and tie it back to dopamine release, and specifically how we can use it to combat drug addiction. Can we increase the value that we place on social award and use that to combat the value that we place on drug award? And if there are pharmaceutical products and natural behavioral ways to do so. I'd like to thank Dr. Lester and Travis Erickson with the Department of Psychology at U of M and Dr. Soren and my fellow HERS students. Hi, my name is Emily Smith and over the summer, I got the ability to work with Dr. Brewster and um, the Department of Chemistry at the University of Memphis on bimetallic catalysts for deoxydehydration reactions. So the petrochemical industry uses a branch of chemistry called petrochemistry that uses crude oil and natural gas to create raw materials. These raw materials are also called feedstocks that, you, that are used to make almost everything around us, including plastics, paint, medicine, cosmetics, batteries, etc. Alkenes are a type of fit chemical feedstock. Um, they are used for detergents, antifreeze, plastic bags, rubbing alcohol, acetone, etc. A lot of plastic products, um, and they are hydrocarbons, meaning they are create they are hydrogen and carbon um, with a carbon-carbon double bond. As you can see, I included examples of alkenes. As you can see, the carbon-carbon double bond. Steam cracking is the current current method to produce. Alkenes, um, they break down large saturated hydrocarbons into smaller alkene hydrocarbons. This process requires the combustion of petroleum. Um, it heats up hydrocarbons to up to 800 degrees Celsius, which releases an estimated 300 million tons of carbon dioxide per year. This consumes 8% of the petrochemical industry's total energy demand. As you can tell, it is not good for the environment. Deoxydehydration is the modern method for producing alkenes. Um, it converts, converts organic biomass to alkenes, um, and organic biomass are basically plants, so carbon-rich material generated by photo photosynthesis. Um, biomass is a fossil fuel alternative, and it is low cost. I included the deoxydehydration reaction below. Um, here's the biomass, and here's the alkenes produced. However, deoxydehydration is not efficient without a catalyst, as you can see here. Catalysts increase the rate of a chemical reaction. They put stress on chemical bonds, making them break more easily. An everyday catalyst um, is yeast. Um, catalase is the enzyme in yeast that breaks down hydrogen peroxide into oxygen and water more efficiently. Um, the hydrogen peroxide binds to the catalase. The catalase puts stress on the hydrogen peroxide, breaking it down into oxygen and water easily. Ligands are most of the catalysts that we are making, um, they contain binding sites or pockets for metals. We use three different ligands, um, each with different hydroxy groups in different places. Um, these metals that we were trying to place into these binding sites have varying oxidation states and the ability to absorb small molecules on their surface. So there are two different binding sites here. The catalyst structure that we were trying to make was we were trying to place molybdenum-6 into this red binding pocket. Um, which is cheaper than the, current than the current catalyst being used. 
rhenium is placed in those catalysts. Um, and rhenium is hard to find in our environment and it is very expensive. Soft metals such as iridium-1, nickel-2, palladium-2, platinum-2, molybdenum-0, or ruthenium-2 were being placed in the second binding pocket or the blue pocket below. Um, and these soft metals activate hydrogen gas so that it can be used as a redox agent. The techniques that we use to prevent these chemicals from breaking down as they were air, they were air sensitive and water sensitive were the glove box and the slink line. So here are photos of me using the glove box. It's basically a box that um, is filled with nitrogen instead of air. And so to bring something in, we had to place chemicals into a compartment and um, the compartment would suck out the air and replace it with nitrogen, and we had to do that three times to make sure that we were able to bring it into the box without contaminating the other chemicals in there. Um, the slink line is a common, more common method used um, inside of a fume hood. There are uh, clear glass tubes with argon running through them, um, and we would use it in the same way as we use the box. We would attach our um, product to the shrink line and we would have to purge it out three times to be able to, to, be able to use it um, under argon. Proton NMR or nuclear magnetic residence um, provided information that we use to verify if a reaction was successful. This uses magnetic properties of hydrogen to analyze a molecular structure and basically the machine measures the interaction of nuclear spins of hydrogen within a magnetic field. It measures the interaction between hydrogen and the magnet inside of this machine. Here are two examples of NMR data. Um, here is the unprotonated version of one of our ligands and here's the protonated version of one of our ligands. As you can see here, here's the added proton. And these peaks are hydrogen peaks, and here's some water, and here's some solvent. And over here, you can see the new hydrogen peak. Um, in conclusion, we created potential precursors for, for the ruthenium-2 and iridium-1 complexes, meaning we were able to successfully place ruthenium-2 and iridium-1 into the blue pockets. Um, we, our next steps are to create precursors for platinum-2, palladium-2, and molybdenum-0, so to place those three metals into these pockets. Um, and then after that, we will place molybdenum-6 into each of those binding pockets up above. After this, we will test the catalyst to make sure that it works on the deoxydehydration reaction. And if it does end up working, it will be used in the petrochemical industry to, produce, to create alkenes, which will be used in plastics. Thank you. I would like to acknowledge, sorry, Dr. Timothy Brewster at the U of M Department of Chemistry, Lindsay Baker, my other mentor at Kalamazoo College, Dr. Soren, Ms. Dunlap, Ms. Antoine, and Ms. Wright, and Josie and Mila for being my first classmates. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mila Shutkovsky, and this summer I worked with Brain Center Memphis in marketing their Hurt to Healing program. Currently, there are over 220 pediatric hospitals within, within the United States, but none of them, with the exception of Le Bonheur Children's Hospital, provide mental health services within trauma centers. Trauma is an experience that feels so threatening to one's safety and well-being that it hinders one's ability to cope with the event. Trauma can affect one's ability to regulate emotions, acquire new motor skills, form new relationships, and can also lead to an increased risk in cancer and heart disease. While trauma not only um, impacts children short term, it can also have mental um, effects on children. So Brain Center Memphis found that 64.8% of children with um, physical trauma were diagnosed with acute stress disorder. Trauma can also have mental impacts like post-traumatic stress disorder, acute stress disorder, and guilt. These common mental symptoms indicate indicate the need for mental health services within trauma centers. Thankfully, Brain Center Memphis has partnered with the University of Memphis and Le Bonheur Children's Hospital to develop and implement the Hurt to Healing program. The Hurt to Healing program provides bedside mental health assessments and treatments and is the first hospital-based program in a level one pediatric hospital, having served over 1,500 pediatric trauma patients since 2021. And it uses integrated behavioral health care, which teaches children how to manage their trauma symptoms and cope within trauma triggering environments. However, 
In order for the HERT to Healing program to be implemented within other pediatric hospitals nationwide, we must first market it so that way it gains traction. However, it's hard to do that when the HERT to Healing program um, does not have a marketing budget. So marketing is the act of creating, communicating, and delivering information about products or services. All businesses use marketing to um, make their services or products appeal to potential clients. So um, marketing the Hurt to Healing program differs from marketing other products and services because one, we are dealing with the healthcare industry, and two, Brain Center Memphis doesn't have a marketing budget. So healthcare marketing differs from other marketing industries because customers associate the quality of the product or service with the quality of the healthcare provider. Therefore, you're marketing both the service and the person providing that service. So when marketing the healthcare industry, we have to answer three main questions. Who are your main customers? In the case of Brain Center Memphis, um, they have three target audiences. The first are patients and their caregivers. The second are the staff who are going to implement the Hurt to Healing program within other hospitals. And, the th and then the third are the hospital administration who are going to implement this Hurt to Healing program in the trauma centers of their hospitals. The second are the needs of the customers. And for all three target audiences, it's an increased quality of healthcare. And the third is how can the organization meet customer needs? In the case of Brain Center Memphis, how can they make sure that the quality of healthcare is increased? And that's by providing the knowledge and resources for other hospitals to implement the HERT healing program. Now, because Brain Center Memphis did not have a budget, we had to rely on organic growth of our social media platforms. So we couldn't rely on advertisements. We couldn't rely on promotions. So when I worked with Brain Center Memphis, I was tasked with targeting their audience of patients and their caregivers. And we thought that the best way to do that was through Instagram. So, a one of the, when marketing a company, um, you have to develop a brand to give the company a um, clear and cohesive image for other clients. And so a key component of a brand is a style guide. And so a style guide establishes um, the font, how or how not to use a logo, the colors of a company. And the style guide can differ in size and detail depending on the company. This here is Brain Center Memphis's style guide. And so um, it, it establishes the text, how or how not to use the logo, and the colors of the company. So a great way to gain inspiration for marketing um, your company is to look at other similar organizations and study their marketing tactics. So here we have Brain Center Memphis's Instagram feed, and they were ranked number one in social media. When marketing the healthcare industry on Instagram, one third of your post should be promotional, meaning it should talk about the benefits of your service. One third of your post should be reposted, which means it should be information from similar organizations. And then one third of your post should be educational, um, informing your target audience on important medical information. So up here, we have an example of an educational post that was on Boston Children's Hospital Speed. And then below that, we have an example of a promotional post talking about how this child benefited from the services of Boston Children's Hospital. So this past summer, I created over 20 Instagram posts. Each time I would create a post, I would send it to Miss Paris and she would give me feedback on my post. And then I would present my post to Dr. Schaus, the founder of Brain Center Memphis, and Miss Wilson, Brain Center's marketing consultant, and they would either approve my post or they would give me more feedback and I'd have to tweak my post or start from scratch. So this is an example of an educational post that I did. Um, in the post itself, you can see that I use the style guide, I use the font of the company, the logo is in the bottom left corner and it's on a solid background. And then the caption goes more in depth about the statement on the on the Instagram post. And below that, we have a link so that way users can click and read more information about the statement on the post. Next, we have a repost. And this was taken from a blog post um, from Mayo Clinic. And the caption goes more in depth about the Instagram post. And below that, there's a link so that way users can read more information. And then lastly, we have a promotional post. And this is talking about the benefits of the Hurt to Healing program. The caption goes more in depth about the statement on the Instagram post. And below that, 
um, users can schedule a consultation or read more information about Brain Center Memphis. So in conclusion, marketing helped us reach our target audience of patients and caregivers, and marketing will continue to help the Hurt to Healing program gain traction from other hospitals. And it's important to implement the Hurt to Healing program, not only so that way there's an increased quality of mental health care, but also to address the disparity within access to mental health care. Brain Center Memphis found that children are more likely to seek in or to seek mental health care when there are services provided in hospitals rather than seek out professional um, mental health care. Additionally, Brain Center Memphis found that white children are more likely to seek out outside professional mental health care than black or Hispanic children. Therefore, if we implement mental health services within trauma centers and pediatric hospitals, we will be increasing that quality of health care for all children. I'd like to thank Dr. Schaus, Ms. Wilson, Ms. Paris, Sydney Allen, Dr. Soren, Ms. Antoine, and Josie and Emily. Thank you.